The following story contains graphic images that could be disturbing to some. Viewer discretion is advised. Good evening. Organized crime has injected itself into so many dark alleys of our society, from numbers rackets to drugs and prostitution. You can now add medical care. Let's start tonight with a hypothetical. Imagine that you or a loved one is sick, suffering from kidney failure. There are now 26 million Americans with chronic kidney disease. The best chance of survival for the sickest of those is a transplant. But time is tight, and you're near the bottom of a long waiting list for donated kidneys, most of which have come from the dead. In the United States alone, that waiting list numbers in the tens of thousands. There is such a shortage of available kidneys that some 4,500 Americans die waiting each year. But then you hear from a friend that there's a way to jump the line. It's illegal, but it could be life-saving. You pay a lot of money to a middleman, a kidney broker, and he takes care of the rest, finds you a living kidney donor, a doctor, even a hospital. What would you do? More and more people, good, reasonable people, are choosing this shortcut. They're unable to find a relative who will donate a kidney and unwilling to suffer years of grueling dialysis treatments. The waiting list grows longer and longer. Skyrocketing rates of obesity have led to an epidemic of diabetes, a major cause of kidney failure. More and more people each year need kidneys. This intense demand has made the organ a precious commodity. The kidney, unlike, say, the heart or lungs, can be taken from a deceased or living donor. Most of us are born with two, but can live healthily with just one. And so in recent years, a black market for the organ has grown and flourished. You don't have to spend too much time looking online to find advertisements posted by Peruvians, Brazilians, Ukrainians, all looking to earn a few thousand dollars by selling kidneys. But these are the exception. We found that most kidney sales are brokered by organized criminals, some trafficking in drugs and sex who in recent years have diversified their portfolios to include this vital organ. Criminals who have gotten rich, recruiting, tempting, and coercing the world's poor and desperate into selling a kidney. This criminal element is the subject of our investigation, one that spanned three continents and brought us from poor rural villages to sleek U.S. hospitals. Tonight, on Dan Rather Reports, the cost of kidney trafficking. We come to you tonight from a country you may never have heard of, Moldova. This tiny nation is at the far edge of Eastern Europe, landlocked between Romania and Ukraine. But this poor, out-of-the-way place is well known to a criminal underworld using people here in schemes to buy human kidneys for desperate Westerners whose lives depend on a transplant. For centuries, this village called Menjir was an unremarkable swath of farmland in one of Europe's poorest corners. When the now independent Moldova was part of the Soviet Union, its villagers subsisted as wine producers. But that market dried up with the collapse of communism. Unemployment, poverty, and hunger spread across Menjir's rolling hills, and desperate villagers began looking beyond Moldova's tiny territory for a way to make a living. What they found was a world that saw them not as people, but as living collections of spare parts. July 23, 2009, the first arrest for alleged organ trafficking in the United States. Federal authorities accused Isaac Rosenbaum of brokering kidneys through a front charity based out of this Brooklyn building 
reportedly part of an Israeli criminal organization that has tapped countries in Eastern Europe for a supply of kidneys for transplant. Rosenbaum has pleaded not guilty and is awaiting trial. Our investigation found that kidney trafficking is global and growing. According to a 2005 World Health Organization study, one in 10 kidney transplants is now bought on the black market, some performed at underground clinics like this one in Turkey, which was recently raided by police. For years, the idea of organ trafficking was the stuff of urban myths and horror films, like the 2006 slasher Touristas, in which bloodthirsty organ thieves prey on fresh-faced American backpackers. Tell me what I and the audience needs to know about the trafficking in kidneys. Well, that it's real, that it's not uh, an urban legend. University of California Berkeley professor Nancy Shepper Hughes has made it her life's mission to prove that organ trafficking is a very real crime. That people don't get kidnapped off the street and end up in a bathtub with, uh, you know, ice and a kidney removed, but that there's other kinds of theft that exist in the world. A renowned anthropologist, Shepper Hughes, has spent much of the past decade researching the cash for kidney phenomenon and writing often cited papers and articles. But she was so outraged by the exploitation she found that she decided to become not only an academic, but a relentless activist, one determined to end organ trafficking worldwide, even if it means getting in between violent criminals and their cash. So there's real money in this to be made. There's big money to be made. When you break it down, you know, everybody's got to be paid. Shepard Hughes' research has brought her face to face with sellers and buyers, brokers and doctors, from Brazil to South Africa, from Israel to New York. And if I go and I talk to the buyers and say, I know who you sold to. She's so connected that she says alleged Brooklyn organ broker Isaac Rosenbaum appeared on her radar years ago. You had alerted the FBI. How long before they broke this case? Oh, about uh, six years. But Shepper Hughes says the FBI refused to take her seriously. You talked to the FBI agent and you said, quote, later you're all over the place. Yeah. And you said, well, so is this. So, so is organs trafficking. And so six years later, they broke this <laughs> they broke the story criminal and ring I in New said, Jersey. I said, there's Isaac Rosenbaum's <laughs> picture. I said, they got him. There's no way to know if federal authorities used the research Shepper Hughes had presented them. In a statement, the FBI refused to discuss the case with us, citing the ongoing investigation. Rosenbaum's lawyer, Richard Finkel, declined to comment on the case. But the high-profile arrest was enough to launch Shepard Hughes on her latest mission. For the first time, the international spotlight was focused on the shadowy organ traffickers, and Shepard Hughes wanted to see how they would respond. Soon after the Brooklyn arrest, Shepard Hughes agreed to take us to some of the hot spots in the international trade in human organs. We paid for her travel expenses. I met her in Moldova, a country she's called attention to for years because it had become a go-to place for kidneys. After following clues from cases all over the world, she ended up here, a sleepy town even by Moldovan standards. But the town of Minjir was well known to organ traffickers. And now, thanks to the research of Shepard Hughes, the secret is out. Over the years, she has documented more than 20 villagers around here who sold their kidneys. And she suspects there are hundreds more across Moldova. She says it is in villages like Minjir that you can see the human cost of the black market in organs, a cost kidney buyers abroad prefer to ignore. Let's say that my sister needs a transplant. She's at 161 on the list or whatever it is. And what's wrong with saying, look, I don't care who gives it. I don't know where we have to go to get it. Let's saddle up, go pay the money, get it done. What's wrong with that? Well, it's just wrong to, um, to take kidneys from people who don't understand the consequences. They don't understand the pain that they're going through. And especially the people who are the sellers are the most vulnerable to kidney disease afterwards.
In Minjir, as with many villages in Moldova, you won't see many able-bodied young men in church on Sundays. Most are working low-paying jobs in Turkey or Russia. Until recently, little connected Menjir to the rest of the world. But the collapse of the Soviet Union brought a wave of organized criminals eager to exploit the vulnerable citizens of one of Europe's poorest countries. They first targeted Moldova's women, binding thousands into forced prostitution and turning the small country into a major human trafficking hub. And then, 10 years ago, the same criminals found a way to also make money off of young men. Men like Nikolai Bardon. The farmer and welder was one of the first here to sell a kidney. Like many, he was desperate to take care of his family and willing to leap headfirst into the unknown. When Shepard Hughes first met Bardon in 2003, four years after he sold his kidney, he was regretful and in poor health. On this trip, she was eager to catch up with him and his wife, Vera. I think about them often and um, want to know how they're, how they're doing now and how, how things, because things were very shaky when we were here. Bordon says he used the money to build a house for his family, and that is where I met him. How do you do? We wanted to know whether he thought his ordeal was worth it. While buyers spend up to $200,000 for a kidney, most of the money goes to a web of middlemen everyone from brokers to rogue surgeons to bribed police and corrupt customs and border officials. All the average seller gets out of the deal, if he's lucky, is about $3,000 and a telltale scar. Oh my goodness, from here down to open here. And many, like Bardon, say they were unwilling sellers to begin with. You thought you were going to Turkey to do what? He says a local woman working as a recruiter for the trafficking network brought him to Turkey with the promise of legitimate work, then took his passport and held him prisoner until he agreed to sell his kidney. The stories of young men being duped are difficult to corroborate. In an earlier interview with Shepard Hughes, Bardon said he set off for Turkey knowing he would sell his kidney, but was misled about the risk. But to me, he insisted he had been tricked. I want to make sure I understand. When you left the village, did you understand then that you would be having a kidney operation? Bardon had nowhere to turn. Shepard Hughes says authorities don't take organ trafficking seriously. Those crimes have been put under the rug. And as your judgment, they are crimes. They are crimes and they're defined crimes. Now, uh, every country doesn't have an anti-trafficking for organs law, but they have laws against kidnapping uh, people who are coerced into travel, who don't know, you know where they're being taken across borders. <laughs> And did you sign that document? Before he had even healed from the surgery, Bordon was on a bus ride back to Moldova with just one kidney and a lifetime of physical and emotional pain. Do you have health problems now? What kind of health problems, if you have any?
Păsărul să nu rădic. Mai mult de 10 și 20 kg nu rădic. Încă dacă rădic, că mă supăr. Tete este așa. Am amiețele, am. Amiețesc. Is there anything else you want to say? Anything you want people to know about this? Să aibă și patienți la... Unii să mărgă la lucru și să aibă... Să nu fac și ei și să se fie întâmplat în Moldova. De asta eu vreau să le spun. The culture is a very male-oriented culture based on honor, codes of honor. And uh, a good man is one who takes care of his family, who is a good neighbor. And that sense of honor was replaced by a profound, profound sense of shame, which is why, you know, when men talk about it, they cry. And these are not men who cry. Menger's Eastern Orthodox priest, Father Antoine, feels sympathy for those who were tricked into selling their kidneys, but he says purposely selling organs is an offense to God. Este un păcat pentru că omul îl face nu ca să se jertfească pe sine, adică pentru sănătatea cuiva, dar o face din păcate de rău pentru a se îmbogăți. We have talked to a number of the people who have given up their kidneys, and they are ashamed, uh, they feel guilty. Have any of them sought comfort through you in the church? No. No, vin. Și noi nu putem să insistăm anume ca ei să să vină după ajutor sau să-i destăinuim sau mai știu eu acolo, eu oricum să sucot umiliți. As for those who recruit the people in the village, those who run this as a business, do you consider it to be criminal activity? Da, da, consider și sunt ferm convins că ei sunt criminali. Criminali în sensul drept al cuvântului, pentru că ei nu că pe sine nu se jertfesc, ei se folosesc de sănătatea cuiva și se îmbogățesc ei. Totodată, It's not just Moldovan priests who are wrestling with the ethics of organ trafficking. Arthur Kaplan is director of the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Bioethics in Philadelphia. In a lot of our Christian, even Jewish theology, you don't own your body. It's a gift from God. You are a steward of it. It's your body, but it's headed back to the gift giver. Kaplan has guided everyone from the White House to the United Nations, to doctors around the world, through medicine's gray zones. He is now leading the conversation about the rights and wrongs of kidney transplantation. He says advances in medicine have made kidney transplants between non-family members relatively easy. It used to be that one limit on selling organs to others was that you had to get the biology to match. So your brother's organ might, might, might or might not be a fit? Your sister's organ? Might not organ. be your fit. Your body takes one look at it and says, <clears throat> foreign tissue, we're attacking it, get it out of here. But new drugs began to appear that tamp down the body's willingness to attack those transplanted organs. And the most powerful drugs today tamp down the body's defenses so much that it won't attack a kidney, even if it's very different. That's what so that, called anti-rejection drugs. That's the anti-rejection drugs. The they don't reject the new kidney, and that opens the door to almost saying, well, anybody could be used as a source for somebody else. That's a little extreme, but it's roughly true. Kaplan says these anti-rejection drugs inadvertently made the illegal trade in kidneys possible. It's now an underground economy feeding off of increased demand. There are more than 83,000 people waiting for legal kidneys in the United States alone. And some doctors and patients advocates argue there should be a more open market for organs. In a recent op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, one physician argued for, quote, legitimate incentives to people who might be willing to donate. 
What about developing a, quote, commodity market? The market goes up, the market goes down, half of Chicago kidney exchange. Mm -hmm. I'm not joking with that. No, no, work? I understand. You can treat people like orange juice and uh, wheat and oil, but I think human dignity and human rights say, look, there are certain ways to exchange money, there are certain ways to treat individuals, and one of them isn't as a portable farm of kidneys to sell off. Kaplan says that inevitably, the world's poor suffer the most. If you say you're gonna sell a kidney coming from a poor village or a poor nation, nobody looks out for your health or your interests once that kidney's out of your body. They toss you aside like an old piece of Kleenex. They don't care. So you're getting infections, you're getting bleeds, you got all kinds of problems going on. They'd be pretty easy to manage if you were getting followed post-donation in an American or European hospital or in a developed country. You go back as a poor person who sold their kidney, you're in trouble. That's what happened to Vladimir Dimenetti. He was one of the young kidney sellers Shepra Hughes met on her last visit to Menjir in 2003. At that time, he was still suffering from complications from his operation four years earlier. Shepra Hughes wanted to check in on him, but shortly before our visit, she found out he had already died. She met with Vladimir's father, Vasil. I'm so sorry. But the father did have some urgent questions for Shepard Hughes. He wanted to know what had happened to the woman who had recruited his son for the kidney traffickers. The same woman who had coerced Nikolai Bardon, whom we met earlier, and dozens of other young men from Menjir into selling their kidneys. He's asking us whether we know anything about that woman. Just that she's a criminal and uh, she was part of a mafia mm -hmm. and uh, she uh, deserves to be in jail and she deserves to be punished. He knows that you know, she, she no, uh, no, 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 dealt with at least 40 boys that you know, yeah. she tricked into doing this. Ah, yes. Oh, he's a tall boy. He's handsome like his father. And then, of course, he's on. <laughs> Did he know what he was getting into when he went to Turkey? When your son came back, was he all right physically? Was he all right emotionally? No. No. Well, it's a beautiful place, my friend. Dimonetti still blames the kidney hunter for his son's misery and eventual death. He told me he even gathered a group of villagers to lynch her a few years back. Moldova remained one of the world's top suppliers of kidneys until recently. But when Shepard Hughes and other activists began calling attention to organ trafficking here, the criminal networks started looking to other countries for kidneys. While the big bosses managed to stay ahead of the law, they left behind low-level kidney hunters like Maureen Stugaru, who granted us a rare interview at the prison where he is serving a 28-year sentence. Sugaru was a down-and-out police officer. He owed a lot of money and sold his own kidney to an international trafficker. Authorities said that was his gateway to becoming a kidney hunter, recruiting others to feed the demand for illegal organs. Stugaru says the foreign traffickers tossed him aside once the job was done. How do you feel about the people abroad who come into this country 
and recruit to get kidneys, to buy kidneys. How do you feel about those people? Women who have been talking to me and have been interested in not to save a human, but to put a bill on the money and put a bill on the money. Hello, Mr. Stugaru. Stugaru says it's his boss, the trafficker, who should be in prison, not him, a self-described small-time local recruiter. He is innocent and he's got more than he can be in prison. Și în sală de judecată am cerut și detectorul J să-mi dă și dacă există alte metode de a afla dreptatea, chiar și așa și narcoci să-mi pui în vână și nu numai mie, și la persoanele pe care mă învinuiesc. Eu am fost de acord și până în ziua de azi eu sunt de acord cu asta. We heard some people in the village here in Moldova use the word uh, mafia. Mobsters. Mobsters. So, yeah, mobsters. What do you consider to be mobsters? Is it that organized? Oh, yes. Yes. We, I mean, it's known. At the very top, who's really making the money are, are, are the top criminal organizers, who I see as a, to use, maybe it sounds rhetorical, but they are an organs mafia. An international organs mafia that Shepard Hughes says has made unlikely associates of alleged brokers like Isaac Rosenbaum in the United States and small-time kidney hunters in little towns like Minjir. Father, have you spoken to any of the traffickers or any of the people in the village who did the recruiting? No, din păcate nu. Nu, nici nu cunosc această personalitate sau eu știu mai multe persoane care care s-au ocupat cu așa ceva. Din păcate, gândesc că dacă s-a fi avut așa posibilitate, cât de cât aș fi încercat să îi îndemn la ceea La pace, la liniște, să fletească ceea ce au făcut, ar trebui să meargă la fiecare dintre acești oameni și să-și ceară iertare pentru ceea ce au înfăptuit, măcar cât de cât m-aș fi străduit. Did it change your life for the better? Nu. Când ce e că nu mai sunt cum am fost deodată, e da, da, într-adevăr că... Nu mă, da, le-a schimbat viața că dar eu să calic toată viața, eu să... Nu sunt așa la care am fost. Deodată și... I find myself thinking, if I were you, I would be angry about what happened to me. De ce e și eu fost, da? Now, when we come back, we take you along the trail from tiny Moldova, up the ranks of the Oregon Mafia, to the doctors and traffickers who make it all possible. You want to see it, so stay with us. Missed an edition of Dan Rather Reports? Or just want to see one again? We're now available on iTunes, so check us out. The sprawling Turkish city of Istanbul, a historic crossroads bridging east and west. For centuries, it has brought people and cultures together. It's long been a center of trade and commerce. The Bosphorus Strait, which bisects Istanbul, separating Europe from Asia, is a vital shipping passage. Istanbul's geography also makes it a perfect place for the black market and organs to flourish. Kidney sellers from poor countries like Moldova come together with wealthy, desperate buyers from the West. Tourists flock here to soak up Istanbul's beauty and history. But there was no time for sightseeing when Nikolai Bourdon was brought here a decade ago. I was here when we were in a camera. There were only boys in the camera, and all from Moldova. There were about 7-8 people. UC Berkeley professor Nancy Shepard Hughes knows Bourdon's story well and she has spent years in covering what's been going on in Turkey to impoverished sellers like him. The sellers were brought in from Moldovan villages. They were trafficked in. 
Our investigation joined Shepard Hughes in Istanbul to see how Turkey and one local surgeon in particular helped make the international organ trade possible. The operations took place here in Istanbul by a doctor who was uh, one of the founders of transplant medicine in uh, Istanbul. He was studied in Paris. He was considered a brilliant doctor, but he decided to throw it all away, essentially, to conduct illegal operations. This is that doctor, Yusef Sonez. Seen here on Turkish television, he admitted to performing thousands of transplants and has been arrested repeatedly for organ trafficking, like after this 2007 raid. But since charges against him have never stuck, he's never served more than a few months in jail, and he keeps returning to the black market he pioneered. Shepard Hughes was eager to find out if one of Sonmez's busiest clinics was still in business, but the doctor had moved on. It's now a nursing home, and its staff wanted to make it clear they had nothing to do with organ trafficking. Did, did he know what was going on here? Uh, Joseph Sumnez was known as Dr. Vulture in Moldova uh, because over the years he had transplanted over 2,000 patients illegally using uh, donors, some of whom were coerced from Moldova. Trapper Hughes says Sonmez played a vital role in globalizing the cash for kidney business. He got his start more than a decade ago matching wealthy Turkish kidney patients with poor sellers and performing the transplants. But business truly took off after Sonmez teamed up with an Israeli counterpart, Dr. Zaki Shapira, who was able to tap into a wave of new Israeli clients. Shapira's lawyer maintains his client's innocence. This place was run like a factory. They basically were bringing bodies in and you know, doing um, one or two a night. And, um, you know, it was very, very productive and very profitable. Some of the Israeli buyers said, I took my life in my hands going to this place. Why would I trust a place that had fewer medications than I had in my, in my medicine chest at home? And he said, a skeletal staff. He said, I thought transplants, you needed 10 people. And he said it looked like uh, everybody, including the cleaning lady, was involved in being drawn in to help out at these surgeries. Professor Shepard Hughes got a glimpse in 2003 when she posed as an associate of Shapira and snuck inside. I went upstairs and I found that there were two Israelis and two Romanian or Moldovans being housed. And uh, at that point, they came after us and we were basically thrown out. Though she was hot on Sonmez's trail for years, Shepard Hughes has never personally confronted him. But in 2007, Turkish television reporter Mehmet Alionel sat down with the doctor for a lengthy interview that captivated the country. Onel has been investigating Sonmez and organ trafficking in Turkey for 15 years. He was the first to expose Sanmez to the public and described the surgeon as charming, intelligent, and chillingly detached. The surgeon described himself as a simple intermediary between rich patients and poor people with kidneys to spare. O'Neill told us Sanmez was so determined to continue his work that after his last arrest, he fled to Azerbaijan, where he remains busy performing transplants. Shepard Hughes wanted to see whether driving the notorious Dr. Sonmez abroad had really made an impact on Turkey's illegal organ trade. So she went to speak to the man who actually trained Sonmez in how to conduct transplants, one Dr. Ulog Erez. You trained Dr. Sonmez. What went wrong? By Dr. Erez's account, Sonmez was an excellent surgeon, but had questionable ethics from the beginning leading Erez to eventually distance himself from his former student. These areas are pretty intensive area. Erez now directs the kidney unit at Istanbul's state hospital and has been put in charge of finding a way to regulate his country's organ trafficking problem. He started with his own hospital, setting up a panel that carefully scrutinizes every prospective transplant. If we see anything wrong, he says no, it's not possible to make any transplantation, it's closed. But determined traffickers have found that dodging these measures 
is as simple as shopping around to Istanbul's private hospitals, which have less stringent standards. They are private hospitals in order to gain money. Here, not state hospital, not university hospital. Because if you have money, they will, come, they will say, okay, come. By 2008, Istanbul had become such a center for illegal transplants that an international association of transplant doctors chose it as the site for the first international summit on organ trafficking. Hundreds of physicians from nearly 80 countries released an unprecedented statement condemning the practice. Shepard Hughes says the declaration was commendable, but in the end, toothless. They're transplant professionals. They want to, you know, to handle it through their norms, through their networks, and... Police themselves. Police themselves. And I have constantly said the next meeting has to have law uh, authorities, has to have anti-trafficking people, and uh, they don't want to go there. There are signs in Istanbul that police are finally cracking down. The same day we spoke to Dr. Erez, Turkish police rounded up more than 40 alleged kidney traffickers. But authorities here are still fighting an uphill battle against an insatiable global demand for kidneys. They feel it's very, very hard at this point to control. People know about Turkey as one of the places where you can be transplanted, and uh, they want living donors. And they'll pay whatever necessary to get them. But transplants of black market kidneys are not limited to places like Turkey. Shepard Hughes and several other sources for our investigation told us a number of surgeons at top-notch American hospitals have transplanted kidneys purchased on the black market. Bioethicist Arthur Kaplan says these doctors justify turning a blind eye by saying their obligation is to their patients. I don't want to believe that some of our finest and best institutions would be involved in exploitation would be involved in what I consider human rights abuses, would be involved in what I would consider racketeering by these bridge and middlemen folks that do it. But I fear some of them are. I think that you can justify it by saying, I got people dying, and my job is to them. It isn't to Moldovans, it isn't to people from the Dominican Republic, it's not to people from Egypt, it's to the waiting list that exists here in Houston, New York, Los Angeles today, that's my worry. Whatever it takes to get them better, that's what I do. I don't accept that as an ethic, but I think that's partly how they might justify it. But no U.S. physician I know would do this. Well, American doctors kind of wind up getting away with this because they don't look very hard. What I mean by that is, if you meet your donor on the web and you're a transplant center doc, you wind up saying, you know, I'm glad you're here, Dan, and I'm glad you want to give your kidney to Art. Now, is it really true you want to give your kidney to Art? And you say, mm-hmm. Well, that's good enough for me, then I'm not going to ask you any further questions. Don't ask, don't tell. Don't ask, don't tell. You're basically not going to push. And why wouldn't you push? It's because you want the business, we don't have enough organs around, and you've got people waiting to get them, and you make money, significant amounts of money, by doing the transplants. But Surely they can't do it, or do they, in hospitals? No hospital would put up with this. No, they do it inside hospitals. In a 2009 report he prepared for the United Nations, one that repeatedly cites Shepard Hughes's research, Kaplan called for enforcing criminal penalties against complicit doctors. We looked into two cases where trafficked kidneys were allegedly transplanted by American doctors in American hospitals we could not independently confirm the allegations. Many of the parties involved, including the hospitals, refused to speak on camera. But Shepard Hughes told me that she had first-hand knowledge of two recent cases at well-known American hospitals, including one in Los Angeles, that she says she witnessed herself after being tipped off by an informant. There was a purchase online uh, through Craigslist, and two people present themselves, you know, one is Asian, you know, one is uh, Anglo, and they don't really know each other at all. In fact, they're very nervous about each other. They have a, not even, I would say, a cockamimi story, and they... And it went through? They went through without any problem. And you think the and doctor And $25,000 went through an elevator uh, that was carried up by the ex member of the extended family, and the money was paid uh, I believe in a hallway, or I believe it was a bathroom behind the surgical unit. 
Shepard Hughes says this took place at the renowned Los Angeles Hospital Cedar sinai We reached out to the hospital to hear their side of the story. In a follow-up email, we also asked a Cedar spokeswoman several general questions about how the hospital screens donors. But the spokeswoman declined to respond, citing patient confidentiality rules, and instead issued a statement that said, quote, if at any time during the evaluation process, the transplant team suspects the donor is inappropriately being paid for a kidney, the transplant is canceled. No one has alleged that Cedar's doctors broke the law, were part of the transaction, or were aware the kidney had been purchased. But Shepard Hughes says they could have, should have, done a better job screening. Then there's the case of Nick Rosen. A few years ago, the Israeli man sent Shepard Hughes a homemade videotape that documented him giving one of his kidneys to a stranger for transplant. Rosen says he was matched with the recipient, a Long Island man, through an Israeli trafficker. The transplant took place at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Rosen says he received $20,000 afterwards. In a telephone interview, Rosen told us he simply wanted to save a stranger's life. The recipient didn't respond to several requests for an interview he made to his wife. A Mount Sinai hospital spokesman also declined to comment. You spend a great deal of time on ethics, what's right, what's wrong, what are gray areas when it comes to physicians, nurses, and hospitals. What ethical obligation do hospitals have when it comes to verifying kidneys, verifying that they were not purchased? What are, what are their ethical obligations? I think every hospital has a duty that they owe to the potential recipient to verify the identity, health status, and competency of the person who is there to donate. You have an absolute duty to check aggressively. Now, I know they're not the FBI in hospitals. I've been around hospitals a long time. You can't get the facts fully on everybody. Time's limited and we don't send detectives out to track down. But basic, simple verification, basic, simple questioning, that ought to be a part of uh, standard expected practice. That would be their ethical obligation. That's their ethical obligation. Do they have any legal obligations? <sighs> they don't really have a legal obligation right now because we haven't established a clear standard of care in the U.S. about how you deal with donors or who may be sellers. U.S. prosecutors now say Isaac Rosenbaum, the alleged Brooklyn broker, brought kidney sellers from Israel to American hospitals where doctors removed their organs. The FBI says they have recordings of Rosenbaum referring to himself as a, quote, matchmaker, bridging his clients to the Israeli sellers. The Israeli connection is not incidental. For years, Israel has been at the nexus of the black market organ trade. The country has a disproportionately long waiting list for organs. Its large Orthodox population is uncomfortable with harvesting organs from the dead even though religious leaders have condoned the practice. Shepra Hughes has traveled to Israel several times, and we accompanied her as part of our investigation. On past visits, she had cultivated contacts with traffickers, sellers, and buyers. They previously had spoken to her quite openly, but she soon discovered the spotlight of the Rosenbaum arrest, combined with new anti-trafficking laws in Israel, had driven her sources deeper into the shadows. It's absolutely uh, a, a taboo topic right now. In fact, the word taboo has come up. People in Israel are good talkers. They, they'll, you know, uh, generally are very, very open and uh, will talk about uh, almost anything. But uh, now uh, there are people who would have not thought twice about giving an interview, especially in the medical profession, say, we're not going to, we just, this it can only reflect badly on us. We did find an Israeli family willing to share their story. The Nagakers, Father Yekazekel, Mother Batsheva, and daughter Ricky Shea, said they are so desperate for justice, they are willing to come forward. Both parents suffer from kidney failure, a complication of their diabetes. Batsheva Nagakar has been waiting on a transplant list for more than a decade and had her legs amputated recently. 
Her husband also waited for a kidney for many years. Watching his wife deteriorate, Yekasekel Nagakar became desperate. My father didn't want to be my, my mother because my mother is waiting, still waiting. But while she is waiting, they took her legs, they took her everything. So he wants to take the chance to live. So in April 2009, he took desperate action. He placed an advertisement in a local newspaper seeking a kidney donor. According to the family, the first to respond was this broker, Yossi Tezeri. He's shown here in hidden camera footage recorded for a story about the Nagakers that ran on the Israeli television program Uvda. Tazeri said that for $100,000, Nagakar could buy a new kidney, but that he would have to travel the thousands of miles to China for the transplant and would have to leave right away. He told him that in two days he can have a new kidney and a new, new life. He sold, sold him a big story, and the next day he was in the airport. Nagakar didn't tell anyone in his family where he was going and for two weeks didn't answer his daughter's frantic phone calls. Ricky Shea recalls the chill she felt when at last he picked up the telephone and she heard his weak voice on the other end of the line. He said to me one sentence, they are killing me here, come and rescue me. Furious and frightened, she drove to Jerusalem to confront the man she learned had sent her father abroad the broker she now refers to as the killer. I talked to that killer in Jerusalem that told me you are not going there. You just sit in home and pray for your father. That's all, you are not going to China. Uh, I told him if he will not give me his address, I will hunt him. The broker eventually relented and Shay and her sister set off for China to rescue their father. She filmed their travels with her cell phone. When the two arrived at the hospital, they could barely recognize their father. I can't imagine in my worst dream that my father is in this place. He was bloated, unconscious, and too frail to make the long return trip home to Israel. So they chartered a special medical flight costing tens of thousands of dollars and evacuated him to Hong Kong. It was very terrifying picture to look at him. He was lying and do nothing. He couldn't open his eyes. He couldn't speak. Now back home, Nagakar appears to be healthier, but looks are deceiving. He is actually in worse overall health than when he left for China because the doctors there botched the transplant. His new kidney is failing, and the retired soldier is now weaker than ever and back on dialysis several hours a week. He's very tired, very weak. He don't have the power to stand. I think my father uh, came older, 20 years. So my father's life changed because he's not the person uh, he was before. We called the alleged broker for an interview and he declined. But Ricky Shea and Shepard Hughes were determined to confront him. Shea showed up at his home with a couple of friends. The alleged broker wouldn't come down. And that's when things got ugly. Do you ever reach the point where you say, this is such an ugly yeah. underbelly of society? Yeah. I'm sick of it, don't have anything more to do with it? Well, I feel that way sometimes. I just want it to be over. That or, you know, really go after the criminals, but don't let it go into this total gray zone of uh, where it's invisible and uh, there's no regulation, no laws, anything can happen to people.
In a moment, an update on this family story and some final thoughts. That's next. In reporting this story, we were struck by how deep the suffering is for many people touched by the black market kidney trade. The desperate patients who take on immense risk and expense trying to save their lives. The exploited sellers and the families of both. We recently learned that the Israeli mother we met who lost both legs while waiting so many years for a kidney transplant died shortly after our visit. Her widower, who underwent the underground transplant in China, has gotten even sicker. The kidney he purchased is failing fast. His daughter, Ricky Shea, who rescued him from the clinic in China, says she's now going to rescue him again, this time by giving him one of her own kidneys. But the tragedy continues. The family says they have learned that the Chinese donor who sold her kidney to Mr. Nagawker has died from complications of the surgery. She was a teenage girl. And that's our program for tonight. From New York, for HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at hd.net.